Hi students. I have created a video tutorial for you. Uh, this lesson is intended to take the place of in-class discussion during the week that I am gone, the week of February 19th. There will be uh, an assignment to accompany this video and your next section review will cover the terms and figures I discuss here. First, I just want to recap some of the topics I discussed with you last week concerning Harriet Jacobs. As you know, Jacobs was the first uh, female former slave to record her memoirs in Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, which was published initially uh, in serial form. Monthly installments would come out, and then finally in 1861 it was bound as a single book. Uh, she was at the time in search of an authenticator and she went first to Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of the anti-slavery tract or novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. But when she was turned down by Stowe, she got the help of Lydia Marie Child as her authenticator. Now there are some or were some contemporary readers of Jacob's novel who attributed its authorship to Child. However, today, common critical consensus is that Jacobs did indeed write the novel. Now, some important, important things I want to cover with you about Jacobs' publication. Um, she was writing to a progressive audience, but she was also writing to a northern female audience of middle-class white women who were, of course, religiously dogmatic and morally prudish. So some of the topics that she discusses in her novel, she handles very, very carefully. She often does not state things outright. She states things rather subversively and I'll get to that in just a moment, but she cannot come out and say anything explicit about the relationship she had with her master for fear that she would be condemned. And remember that in the 19th century among white women, the foremost role of the woman was to be a mother. It was very important to be um, pure in thought and mind and she was the heart of the household as it were and black women could not ascend to that level now Harriet Jacobs was well aware of this and this is why she again handles some of these topics very very delicately and that will be even more important when we discuss the character of Luke which I want you to pay attention to She was the first to openly discuss miscegenation. Miscegenation, as a term, was more or less invented in the 19th century to describe the romantic or sexual re relationship between two individuals of perceived different races. So in those days, it would be between a black person and a white person. Now. In Harriet's case, this relationship was not consensual, and so the term miscegenation, regardless of who was using it at the time, had very negative connotations. It usually implied rape. Now, in the 19th century and early 20th, miscegenation referred to uh, the black male as the aggressor in a miscegenation case. However, Harriet was the first to identify the white male as the aggressor in her particular set of memoirs. And another thing to remember that's important about Harriet Jacob's narrative was that she chose her own lover. Uh, this was key once again because it was unheard of for a black woman to have any choice in any matter, let alone the person she would love. And whether or not she was deeply in love with the attorney, 
uh, who became the father of her children, is unclear. She did have some deep feeling for him, but he more or less abandoned her after freeing their children. And, of course, her master, uh, James Norcom, would consistently remind her that the children were legally his and that he could take them back into slavery at any point at his whim. Also, uh, that being part of the machinations of the master, the way that he kept himself in control at the top of this hierarchy. Um, and we discussed the topics of ownership versus possession. Um, we discussed what it was to own something. You can own an object, a book, a piece of paper, a pencil. You can own that as one of your belongings. But to possess someone or something means to control it. And this is what Flint, a.k.a. Dr. Norcom, was attempting to do. Also, through miscegenation, white masters could often control their slave population and insinuate themselves into the lives of their slaves and reinforce the notion of his power over them. Now, there was a practice that was common in places like New Orleans, Louisiana, Natchez, Mississippi, St. Augustine, Florida, and that was called plassage. And plassage in French literally means to place. Um, and these were calculated sort of common law marriages that occurred between European white men and women of mixed ethnic background, usually African American or Native American and European. And oftentimes these women would be sort of groomed by their mothers to, by the age of 16 or so, attend a mulatto ball where they would meet this gentleman and uh, he would take care of her for a certain length of time, usually uh, construct a cottage or a place for her to live and raise his child in some cases. Now this as an active practice started to trickle out in the early 1800s. However, it did produce some fairly noteworthy individuals, one of whom was Marie Laveau, who was known as the premier voodoo priestess of New Orleans. And so the top this in this entails the topics that I wanted to discuss with you and point out to you as we uh, cover Harriet Jacobs' life and narrative. The themes of moral duplicity of the white slaveholder, of course, and the subversion of the oppressed individual. In one case, a slave, in another case, a woman, and in many cases, the slave woman was oppressed, but oftentimes these practices of plassage or miscegenation created ways, subversive ways, of resisting an oppressor. In the case of Harriet Jacobs, of course, her taking the lawyer Samuel Sawyer as her lover, of course, angered Dr. Norcom, but at the same time, she asserted herself as an agent of free will. This was a commonality to African Americans and women of the mid-19th century. Case in point, as I mentioned last week in lecture, the spiritualist movement of the 1840s, beginning of the 1840s, introduced a means by which women could find their way to the public spectrum 
into the public sphere. At the time, they were disallowed from speaking publicly. And when the trans medium presented herself, suffragists found a way to use this ruse, and that's effectively what it was, to get women in the public sphere. The trans medium, like Cora Hatch, for instance, was a woman of about 15 or 16 years old who claimed to be able to communicate with spirits and they would talk through her. And the assumption was that as long as the spirits were in control, that would permit her to speak publicly. So this was one slant, subversive way that at least white women made their way to the public forum. The last subject for this discussion of Harriet Jacobs' incidents in the life of a slave girl is the subject of Luke. Luke, if you have already completed the reading, is a runaway slave that Harriet meets up north. And you'll notice that he, she, Harriet Jacobs, gives a reproduction of his mode of speech. And it's very interesting that she's kind of reaching back into the oral tradition, into the vernacular tradition, um, to create this character. And bear in mind, although this is a record of her life and her experience as a slave woman, much of it has, in fact, been fictionalized because it reads very much like a novel. And in fact, some argue that her novel was constructed as a kind of allegory to Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre of some years earlier. Be that as it may, I think the character of Luke is very important because he reintroduces the trickster figure, this time in lit literature, in written literature. So I want you to pay careful attention to Luke and what he represents or may represent. So that's it for now. I hope this was in some ways helpful, maybe even a little entertaining. I will... Look forward to seeing you all next week, and in the meantime, take care and do your homework and the reading. Follow the syllabus, and I'll see you soon.